So if we were to maybe approach it in a different way, let's say I were to graph, just, just graph both of these lines. Okay, that would look like graphing y equals x minus 2 and graphing y equals 4x. Right. We'll just, we won't put any restrictions on it to start with. Uh, let's make this one uh, blue and the other one will be orange. Okay. So All right, so we graph the blue one. Well, that has a y-intercept of negative 2 and a slope of what? 4. Or right. zero. Of 1 and 1 over 1. Not 0. <laughs> 0 would look like uh, would be a flat line and there wouldn't be an x in the equation. So as a slope of 1, a y-intercept of negative 2, right? So I put a y-intercept of negative 2 there. Slope of 1, so to the right 1 and up 1. And I would graph my line. Follow, trying to trying to follow that slope backwards. Let's see if I can put some points here to help this guy. So following that slope back that way. Now let's graph the other guy. He's got a y-intercept of what? Zero. Yeah, there's a plus. If I wanted to, if I had to put a plus something, it would be zero. Uh, if I had to. So. There's our y-intercept 0, a slope of 4, so over 1 and up 4. All right, I'll graph that guy, try to keep the slope going here. Uh, oh, there we go. So far, all I've done is graph two lines on the same plane. Okay. But I've graphed too much because what this guy in blue says is to only graph it if x is less than 0. So let's look at this part of the line. What can you tell me about x after this part of the line, Hughes? So I shouldn't have drawn that, right? So maybe in the first place, uh, if I had you know, been well versed in this, I wouldn't have graphed that at all. I shouldn't have graphed that. Definitely shouldn't have graphed this. This is even more bigger than zero. Uh, this is in, the, in an area where x is bigger than zero, right? All that stuff over there to the right of zero. x is greater than zero here, 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 and here, and here. And Right up to there. Right, now we're to zero. But even still, it says, yeah, it's going to be an open circle because it says graph only when x is less than zero, not when x equals zero. So where x equals zero for this graph, we are going to put an open circle to show that we understand what it's saying. That we want to graph it only when x is less than zero, not equal to zero. Okay? So there's that part of it. So now on the flip side, this graph is the graph that we should see when x is greater than 0. And there it is. Right? You see the orange graph? This is where we should be seeing the orange graph. x is greater than 0 here. x is greater than 0. x is greater than 0. But right here, that's where x is 0. Well, we're also supposed, to, also supposed to graph that graph when x is 0. So still good. But once we get to the left of 0, less than 0, we shouldn't be graphing that graph anymore. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So So if I had graphed it correctly from the beginning, I would have just not drawn those graphs at all. all right, does that make more sense? This graph, this orange graph, exists only where x is greater than or equal to 0. This blue graph, x minus 2, x minus 2, only exists where x is less than 0. And remember, 
that open circle for when we kind of hit that barrier. If, it's, if we're not supposed to graph it at that place, we don't graph it at that place. Okay, so I think the next one is uh, it's the same idea. It's just that there are multiple graphs, like I mean, more than two graphs. There's three graphs we're supposed to manage here. Um, part that I didn't quite get was describe the domain and the range. Oh, is that part of two? I should read the directions fully, shouldn't I? Uh, describe the domain and range. Okay, so we're just going to say what the domain and range are. The domain is the set of all the inputs. Uh, what say? Uh, domain. What numbers can go into this function? Yes? All real numbers. Okay, what makes you say that? So on both sides, left and right, mm -hmm. not up and down. So on both sides, to the left, right, forever and ever and ever, I see graph, right? So any input gives me some output, right? So input, good. Any, any input that's less than zero, good. Zero, good. Anything greater than zero, good. I pretty much covered all the numbers, right? Numbers that are less than zero, zero itself. Numbers that are bigger than zero, I don't think I lost anything out. You see what I'm saying? What Cadence was saying is like we have graph on the left and on the right and at zero. Yes? Was the output then that would be all real numbers too? Well let's see. If it's all real numbers, then they're then when we look at the output, which is the y value, which is vertical, then like it's possible to get every single output imaginable. Right? Could I like does this graph go up to a million? Yeah. Does it go down to a negative a million? Yes. Yeah. Uh, does this graph have a like? Does it have a point at the y value of five? <coughs> yes. So does it have no. a point? No. Y value five. Here's the y value five. Do you see graph there? Yeah. Yes. Right over there. Yeah. So yeah. Negative five. Does it have a y of negative five anywhere? Yes. There's graph. Are there any y values that it doesn't include in the graph? Sure. Uh, negative one. Negative one. There is no graph there. Look left, you look right, forever. No graph, right? So negative one is out. Ne what else is out? Negative two. Negative two is out because even though that's the y-intercept of this graph, that graph doesn't exist for x equals zero, so we don't get to have negative two as an output. Uh, any other numbers? Yeah. Well, everything between those, like from. Everything between negative one and negative two? No. And oh up to zero, but not to zero. Okay, so it cannot be numbers, so this is how Sean is describing it, the, the, the y cannot be numbers that are between zero and negative two, right? But it can be zero. So we can yeah. say like, for the, the range, uh, y is, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, Let's say all real numbers <coughs> except where y is so between 0 and negative 2. So it needs to be, uh, <coughs> it can't go down to negative 2, right? right? Y cannot take on the value negative 2. It can't be greater than negative 2 if it's also less than 0. Sure, I got that right before I call on cadence. Uh, yeah. That's a little confusing because we're not saying what y can be. We're saying it can be everything except for it can't be these things, right? And so it cannot be negative two. It cannot be in between anything between negative two and zero, but I left off the equals two because it could be equal to zero. We do have a y of zero right there. But everything else, y could be everything else. It could be positive a million, negative a million, positive five, negative five, uh, one half, three fourths, negative, two point one 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 one. Like all those numbers, y could be just can't. I mean, you could also say 
it in a different way. We can say the range in terms of what y can be, y can be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Or y can be less than, strictly less than, negative two. There's another way we can say it. Okay. It's, it's a little bit shorter that way. Maybe you'd like to say it that way. So y can be greater than or equal to zero. You see y values, right? This graph has y values at zero to infinity. It also has values from not negative two, but just below negative two and down to negative infinity. Okay, so number six has three functions. Y is equal to three different functions. I think it's x plus two. The other function is five. Last function is three x. We're gonna graph negative x plus two if x is less than or equal to negative two. Or let's jump over to down to 3x. Uh, we're going to graph the function 3x if x is greater than or equal to 1. And we're going to graph the we're gonna graph y equals 5 if x is between negative 2 and positive 1. So one graph is from here to the left. Yeah, this one on the right is from this number on to the right. And this one's in between those two. We could, we could do that, like I said yesterday, with as many functions as we wanted. It's piecewise. It can be as many pieces as you want it to be. This one's in three pieces. Shrink this down a bit. It's a little bit more room. Really pretty large. There we go. OK. Um, I just don't, I'm not sure why, but I just feel like graphing the middle function first. So let's graph the middle function in a red color. All right. So we'll graph the graph y equals 5 between negative 2 and positive 1, right? So like between negative 2 and positive 1. Between negative 2 and positive 1, that's where we're going to see the graph y equals 5. What does the graph y equals 5 look like? Okay. So you have to go up to the 5 on the graph. To the 5 on the y-axis here. And anything in between negative 2 and 1. So like a line between, right? What kind of line? Horizontal line? Yeah, horizontal line, a flat yeah. line, right? So between negative 2 and 1, but not at negative 2 and not at 1, right? Open circles. Open circles. So like Hayden said, between negative 2 and positive 1, we have this horizontal line, open circles at both ends. So when we get to negative 2 <laughs> against 1, we don't graph that graph, but we symbolize that with an open circle. Now let's graph this one. Would this be the graph that's kind of off to the left or off to the right? Somebody besides Cadence this time. Sean? Uh, that, the top one? Yeah, that top one. It would be greater than uh, negative 2, so it would be to the, to the right. To the right. What's it say here? Oh, less than, sorry. X is yeah, less than negative 2, so it would be off to the left, right? Left of less than negative 2. And we'll change that to uh, purple color. Okay, so this one, uh, wherever X is less than or equal to negative 2. Uh, so I can be real strict about it and, and never draw anything in here, but also I could go ahead and negative x plus 2. I can draw nothing in here because I'm not supposed to, or I can draw it just for a second and erase it after I'm done because it would be kind of helpful if I had the y-intercept of 2. And there's, like, if I was doing this in pencil, I'd do it really faintly. Uh, slope of negative 1, right? So it's the left 1 and up 1. So that'd be a point, but uh, I'm not supposed to graph this graph here. But this point right here, fill it in solid because that is what the graph, it, it, right? That's where the, the point is for that graph at x is negative 2. And we graph up there. Right, okay. And it was the 
erase those points because they're not supposed to really be there. How's that look? Does that make sense? Great, you got thinking oh, eyes on it. Oh, no, actually, I see. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Right, right. Last one. All right, do that last one. Uh, so I should graph it where x is greater than or equal to 1, so it only should start here at x <coughs> equals 1 and go greater than that, whatever this thing looks like. Well, it's got a y-intercept of 0, like we had on number 2. It's got a y-intercept of 0. It's got a slope of 3, so I'll go up 3 to the right one from there. Okay, that puts us at 1, so I'll put a solid built-in circle. Put another one with the slope going that way so that I can... done graphed it, yeah? The range would be like all numbers between negative 2 and positive 1 below 3, right? Between negative? Would the I think we're trying to do the domain of the range like yeah. all at once. So wouldn't the domain could be all real numbers, right? Okay, who, who agrees with Sean. It could be any real number. The domain can be any real number. The input can be anything. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Okay. So oh, Sean yeah. disagrees. Then he agreed again yeah. with himself. Yeah, it can be all real numbers because that's kind of covered right here. It's telling you what x can be, right? And as long as these functions don't, you know, explode or something for some given value of x, uh, then everything should be fine. Like, they should give an output and so negative 2 is good. It gives me a point at negative 2. Uh, negative 1.9, that's good. There's the point right there, negative 1.9. Uh, 1, there's the point for 1. There, there's the point for 2, and so on. Any x is going to give me an output, and so that tells me the domain is all real numbers. But the range is different. Okay? There are definitely some y values that it cannot be. All positive numbers? All positive numbers. So let me ask you this, positive 2. Is that in the range? No. Let's see. Is there any way that I'm going to get an output of 2? Is there uh -huh. anywhere on this graph, anywhere, where it looks like x comma 2? No. no. That's what I was kind of saying. I was kind of saying that the yellow, if you go straight across from 3, 3 and down is like all the stuff that you can't be between those two. Right. So like, if I look at the graph, the lowest y value is at 3, 3, right? You can figure that's okay, kids. So the range would be like, um, greater than, so y equals, uh, no, y is greater than or equal to 3. What does everybody think about that? We might be a little yeah. worried about this area here. Definitely, like this is all great, and okay. but mm -hmm. for sure, I mean, that we can get an output of three, of four. Well, actually, we can get an output of four there and there. Uh, we can get an output of output of five there and there, and all along here, like infinite number of points that have a y value of five, right? And then beyond that, yeah. So there's, it looks a little messy. The question is, does y have all those, does this graph have all those y values? Yeah, it does. It has three and bigger than that. And it doesn't have anything less than three. So there's our range. The, the range is greater than or equal to three. Or the range of y is greater than or equal to three is the range. Okay? Good. Good. Glad to spend some time on this. I know we were a little rushed yesterday, so. Such is the nature of things. Number 11. Number 11. Mm. Landscape. The landscaper rents a wood chipper for four days. The rental company charges $100 for the first day, $50 for each additional day. Write and graph, write and graph a step function that represents the relationship between the number of days x and the total cost of renting the chipper. Wow. So he rents it for four days. 
right? So we don't really have to worry about this graph or this function beyond four days. Okay. Hmm. So what do you guys think? Would it make more sense to look at the function, the piecewise function, or the graph first? So like the y equals the bracket, all that stuff first. Okay. Y equals bracket. Okay, so there's four days. So I think probably there's um, four. four little pieces to it, right? Piecewise function, four pieces. Right. Let's talk about like where these graphs are going to, where these functions are going to exist. Um, so, well, we're not going to have x is negative, right? There'll be negative days. So start at zero. Start at zero days and x. Could you write it for zero days? No. no. I guess technically you could. You could just like round oh. it and get it right back. Oh, okay. So you don't rent it. Hmm. So if we do say, like, if I actually rent it, then I don't rent it for zero days. So we'll say x is strictly greater than zero because we won't entertain the silly idea of renting it for zero days. Yes. Why not? Yeah. Okay. It just means the graph's going to have an open circle rather than a closed circle there. It's not that big of a deal. It's a little bit of a philosophical thing. Uh, so between zero days and how many days will this price then start to change? One day. Right? Up to one day. Including that one day or not? Including. Including, including that one day. Up until the one, one full day. Right? Uh, so the function is going to be the cost of renting that thing for that one day. So it says a uh, company charges $100 for the first day. Seems pretty clear, right? So from the minute I, like, the credit card transaction takes place and I'm starting to load it into my truck, I'm renting it. And it's costing me how much? $100. $100. So it equals 100 if, zero, if x is between 0 and 1. Okay, so if x is between 1 and what? 2. 2, right? Between the first and second days. It's 50x plus 100. 50x plus 100. It's 50 plus 100. It's 150. Right? Strictly just $150. Like, there's no x component to this. Oh. Right? You might feel like it is. If we were maybe less advanced algebra students, we might draw a graph that has a slope of 50, right? 50x plus 100, that'd be a good start. But really, you don't ever pay anything between 100 and $150. You don't pay anything between $0 and $100. You only pay 100, 150, 200, right? So it's a step function, not, not really a linear function. Uh, next, between two days and Three days, it costs you how much? 200. 200. And between three days up to the fourth day, it costs you 250. 250. Right? So let me look at the graph, and we're going to kind of zoom in pretty far this graph because there's not that thing focused on. Take these numbers off to the side because we want the scale not to be from like zero to tens, hundreds. Okay, but uh, here's one, two, three, four, and so on. Days, days on the x-axis, and dollars on the y-axis, or the f of x-axis. So between zero and one days, not including zero, but including one. This little easier spot. Uh, it'll be a hundred dollars. Let's see, maybe we'll make each of these 25. Okay. So that would put a hundred right there. So we won't include zero because that would mean we didn't rent it, which Jacob says. So I, I think that makes sense. Uh, up to one day, and including one day, it cost us a hundred dollars. Right? Each of these marks is 25 dollars. After, like 
right after that, at whatever the cutoff is, 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock at night for when they cut you off for uh, returning it, then immediately, whenever you turn it in after that on this next day, it's going to be costing you $150. Starts out up here. Right? Open circle because that's, that's exactly one day, so that would be just $100. But just after that, it starts costing you $150 until the cutoff time of that day. And after that, it's going to jump up to $200. And be $200 for that third day. And jump up to $250 and remain $250 to the end of the fourth day. And our step function. Okay. And I think that was it. Yeah. Just graph and write the functions. There's the function, kind of. Graph on top of it a little bit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, you know, it kind of required us to sit and think about it for a while, and it wasn't immediately just obvious. Okay. Just because you uh, know something, you have the knowledge to do something, it doesn't mean it's obvious right away. Think about it a little bit. Sometimes it helps to do backwards. To think about the days first, and then how much it's going to cost. Or maybe it doesn't help. Maybe you think differently. Um, any other questions? Can I can graph piecewise function. I can send my fluent and piecewise functions. Let's take out a piece of paper. Get ready. Uh, we got our like our cutoff at negative six, so I put a big red mark there at negative six. This is the function that we're going to see when x is greater than negative six, and so that would be the right. Because x is greater than something, means we're to the right of it. Uh, so that one's pretty easy. Like, whenever it includes zero, that makes it pretty easy to graph because we get to do the y-intercept and just graph it and as normal and cut it off. So you get the y-intercept of negative two, slope of three halves, right? Positive slopes go up and to the right. So that's going to be down three and the left two, down three and the left two, down three and the left two. Okay. Put me right there, negative six, open circle. There is my graph. This guy here has a, is a uh, y intercept of 2. So I went ahead, you can see a tiny little dot right there. I just kind of for guidance for me. To so start at 2, it's got a slope of a negative 5 sixths, which means it's going to go down and to the right. So I know I'm going to come to the left, 6, go up 5. I'll go to the left 6 again and up 5 again so that I have another point to connect it to solid. Lot, or solid uh, building circle, right? Because that is at negative six. And connect those two points with all those infinitely many dots. And we have it. Any questions about that? exercising a, a skill that we've started on before. That's the transformations of graphs, really. Like when we alter a function, what does it do to its graph? Okay? A nice function for seeing that, for seeing those transformations clearly, is this perhaps a new function. Have you guys heard of the absolute value function? Absolute value? Absolute value. Heard of absolute value. Okay. So then Right, two vertical lines, that's how uh, we symbolize absolute value. Can somebody tell me what the absolute value of negative 5 is? 5, right? Yes, so the absolute value of negative 5 is positive 5. So uh, it's a distance from 0. Right? So absolute value is the distance from 0. So let's fill out a little table as we start to think about graphing this. F of x, f of x equals the absolute value of x. It's as an absolute value of x. So 
let's let x be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Value is like just always make this the positive, right? Of whatever numbers inside of those, those uh, vertical lines. So before I graph it, or as I set up to graph it, what would you say is going to be the shape of this graph? A straight line. A straight line. Any other guesses what you think this is going to look like? Um, Maybe like a U. Like a U because it goes back up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you think it's going to look like the function y equals x a little bit? Pretty close to y equals x, except for the absolute value of x. Right? So if, we're, if I put in a positive number and I get out a positive number, then it's going to just be the same as y equals x. Right? No difference. It's going to look a little different when we throw negative numbers in there. So let's, let's throw these points up on the graph. 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. Let's go into the negatives. Negative one, positive. Negative one, positive four. Negative two, positive two. Negative three, positive three. Negative four, positive four. Negative five, positive five. Right? So to the right, it's a straight line. It's got a slope of one. Slope of positive one. To the left, though, it's also a straight line, but it has a slope of negative one. So how would you call that shape? Would you agree that it's a U shape? A V, a v shape. That was a good guess, right? U is a good guess. Uh, there are graphs that are U shape. This one's V because, well, that absolute value, it's not a gradual change. It's like as soon as you put a negative number in there, it just bing, bounces it back into the positive values. Right? Um, see, I'm going to give you a couple little practices here. We started with this before, okay? So I'm going to take f of x, and I'm just going to change it a little bit. f of x, I guess we'll call it g of x because it's a different function. g of x equals the absolute value of x, just like f of x, except plus 1. Are you going to move to the right one? Any other guesses? Let's find... Okay, so here's g of x. Well, g of x is just like f of x. Okay? Put in 1, just to this part right here. Put in 1, get out 1. Put in 0, get out 0. Put in negative 3, get out positive 3. But you add 1 to it after you do the absolute value. So if you look at f of x, it is the absolute value part. What would I do with each of these numbers to get g of x? Add plus 1. Just add 1. So 3 plus 1 is 4. 2 plus 1 is 3. Plus one, two, zero, plus one, one, two, three, four. What do you think going to do? How do you think that graph's going to look compared to this orange graph? Oh, it will be up one up from this graph. It will be one up, yeah. One up from each of these points. All right, we'll keep going on this tomorrow. See you guys have a good day.